Hello everyone, a very very good evening to all of you. Welcome to Study IQ IAS English. I am Abhishek Singh and uh, as you all are aware that I am bringing this uh, session of the India's Ancient Past by R.S. Sharma. I think R.S. Sharma is that book that everybody amongst you must have studied or must have heard the name of that book. But in this session that we have started, we are going to cover all the important points, all the important aspects of this book chapter by chapter. So today we are going to cover the next chapter in this book. But there is a surprise, there is a special feature as well that we have added the portions from the new NCRT examples, photographs as well as the contents from the Tamil Nadu board so that you get a consolidated content, you get a consolidated right, consolidated uh, approach from all the books. So here we are going to start it. So very good evening everybody, those who have joined the session, good evening to all of you. Quickly share this session with your friends as well so that they can also join it on the time. Everyone you can please just share this session and uh, we will be starting this session very quickly. But before that if you have not seen the yesterday's lecture, please watch that. And if you have any queries or doubts or questions, you can ask those queries or questions directly here in the chat. Yes, definitely Abhishek, I will be giving the PDF as well, but PDF that will be uh, given after the completion of week. So at the right, at the end of the week, you will be getting the PDF also. Dawar Hussain, good evening to you, good evening. So guys, first of all, before we could proceed further, let me tell you about the P2I batch that Study IQ is uh, uh, bringing for all of you. So those aspirants who are looking forward to appear for 2024 civil services examination, <coughs> they can appear for the examination after the complete preparation through this particular batch and this particular batch is available in bilingual as well as English or Hindi medium, whichever medium the student is comfortable in. Apart from that, if you are registering this, uh, registering for this batch today only, so you are going to get this special book written by a special person, a very senior bureaucrat, right? Uh, Anil Swaroop sir has written this particular book that tells us about the right mindset for a civil servant and all these things which include the GS, current affairs, books and everything else, you are going to get at a cost of rupees 70,000. But if you are using this code ASR live, this is going to be the fees for entire course. Now, let us move to the topic, okay? So the topic for today, topic for today that is the modern historians of ancient India. Now, this lecture is going to resolve all the doubts that you guys are having. So Aisha and Abhishek and everybody else, those who are here in the session, let me tell you that all of you must have heard that nowadays there is a fashion of distortion of the history. The people are claiming, the people are claiming that till today we were studying the wrong history and now onwards we are going to study the right history. This is the buzz in the social media, isn't it? The WhatsApp university has become the new source of the knowledge for all of us. Am I wrong? So, those candidates who are seriously and sincerely preparing for the civil services examination, now this is the duty. This is the duty where, right, where as a teacher, I am going to give you the complete understanding of the distinct, distinct opinions or different schools of thought as far as the historical descriptions are concerned. Okay, everyone? <coughs> Sorry. So here, if we talk about the ancient historical records, right? Ancient historical records of India. So India's ancient historical records, they are very special records. And why are they special? Because the ancient Indian historical records, they have few peculiar features, few important features. Those features were exactly, right? They were exactly uh, disclosed by the serious study of the ancient documents. From that study, we got to know that our historical documents were primarily oral recensions. What is the meaning of the oral recensions? That in India, we had the tradition of transmission of the knowledge through the oral recensions 
For example, I am delivering this lecture to all of you. Some of you might be hearing or listening to this lecture and you may remember certain points and after that you will be telling this lecture about this lecture to some of your friends. That is one example. Here in this type of practice you are losing some knowledge. I have told you suppose a hundred things out of those hundred things your mind is able to recall suppose 90 things and to whom you are telling that 90 thing right that person is able to receive only 80. So this is a type of a loss of the knowledge in the in the oral recensions. But let me tell you one more thing. You might have heard about uh, the tradition, the tradition called as Shruti, the tradition called as Shruti. Shruti tradition is related to the Vedic literature, right, related to Vedic literature. So what is the meaning of the Shruti tradition? Shruti tradition is when a person listens to the listens to the piece of knowledge and completely by heart that okay completely by heart that after that the exact word to word okay word to word transmission that is made hanuman chalisa i think that is something that most of you might have remembered or might have heard or the poetries which you have uh, you might have heard in the school times or that uh, Zingle Bell song or Happy Birthday song, all these are what? You have simply heard it, you have never read it. You have heard it and you remember it and after you, your children will remember the same song, isn't it? So that is basically the example of oral recensions. So Indian historical records also have the same oral recension. Our national anthem, it is written but most of us, we hear it and we remember it and then we transfer it to the next. Okay. Now, so primary examples of the oral recensions that include the Vedas, that include the Vedas. Okay. There are different uh, names and the different categories of the Vedic literature. Primarily, we know about the four different Vedas which exist. That is Rig Veda. Samaveda, Yajurveda and Atharvaveda, all these things are there. These have been transmitted from generation to generation through the, through the oral recensions. Now, non-chronological, non-chronological, what is the meaning of this word non-chronological? So, according to the research of the ancient documents, there are very few documents, very, very few documents such as Raj Tarangini, Raj Tarangini. This is a very, very special book. Very special book. Why? Because this is probably the earliest book which provides us the information in a chronological manner. In a chronological manner. What is the meaning of chronological manner? Chronological, that manner basically means, that basically means about a particular time. Right? A particular time. So, beginning from the earliest and moving to the moving to the latest so beginning from the earliest and moving to the latest that is the meaning of that is the meaning of chronology all right everyone and in india we had very less literature very less you can say literature to indicate that there was a sense of time keeping there was a sense of chronological formation of the records the people used to keep the records, but uh, chronology that was missing, that was missing. It will be in the classical age or in the Christian era mostly, when we will have, we will start having the calendars. Okay, calendars. For example, you might have heard about the Vikrami's era, right? Vikram era. You might have heard about the Gupta era, Gupta era. You might have heard about the Kalchuri era, okay, Kalchuri era or Shaka era, okay. So, what is the meaning of this era? What is the meaning of this term called era or calendar? Basically, this was the indicator of, 
इंडिकेटर ऑफ अ सिग्निफिकेंट इवेंट व्हिच टुक प्लेस इन हिस्ट्री फॉर एग्जांपल सपोज आई स्टार्टेड द एनसीईआरटी यस्टरडे ओके यस्टरडे सो नाउ यू विल बी काउंटिंग द डेज सिंस यस्टरडे और आवर प्राइम मिनिस्टर टुक द ओथ इन 2014 सो दैट इज द दैट इज द बिगिनिंग ऑफ अ न्यू एरा ओके और सपोज चंद्रगुप्ता फर्स्ट राइट चंद्रगुप्ता फर्स्ट ऑफ द गुप्ता डायनेस्टी टुक द ओथ इन 320 एंड ट्वेंटी एडी सो दिस इज द बिगिनिंग ऑफ अ न्यू एरा सो समथिंग समथिंग विच इज सो सिग्निफिकेंट दैट इट इंडिकेट्स द बिगिनिंग ऑफ अ न्यू काउंटिंग ऑफ द डेट दैट इज वॉट वी कॉल एज द कैलेंडर सो मेनी किंग्स मेनी किंग्स हैव स्टार्टेड दे हैड स्टार्टेड देयर ओन कैलेंडर्स and this is where we have the examples like the hijri calendar in islam we have the separate bangla calendar we have the vikram calendar vikram samvat right that is vikram era and that is saka era so different types of calendars are there so indians they developed the chronological order of the historical reconstruction much later than the greek or the latin counterparts then there is another feature of the ancient indian historical record now what is this feature dear what is the meaning of this particular feature metaphoric language right metaphoric language means what you might have heard about certain terminologies that for example suppose there was a king who ruled over the entire earth over the entire earth for 10000 years for 10000 years such type of mentions have been made in the puranas in the puranas okay not just in the puranas even if you go through the jain literature if you go through the jain literature or the jataka stories jataka stories they have the historical character without any doubt but they are also having certain features which cannot be called historical but we can call them as the part of metaphoric language for example it is said that lord mahavira right lord mahavira he was so tall that he measured 52 hands from his own hand length currently using our own hands we are having 3 and 1/2 hands of the length it was said that he used to be the 52 hands is it even biologically possible no but it is claimed that it is claimed that there are the stories there are the you know there are the claims so similarly if we say that uh, some of the right some of the puranas for example there is a story in the purana that uh, one of the elephants one of the elephants was praying to lord vishnu when a crocodile had grabbed the leg of or the feet of the elephant so that elephant keep that right, kept on praying for lord vishnu for 10000 years now can you even imagine that an elephant first of all the elephant will pray and second thing the elephant is praying for 10000 years and then the lord vishnu came and he just used his used his disc to cut the throat of that uh, crocodile okay so all these type of hypothetical metaphorical stories they have been used in the historical records of ancient india making it difficult for the historians to collect the fact and separate or filter out the fiction from that particular record got it everyone so this is how the literature of ancient india provides about the history now use of the hyperboles again the same thing hyperboles means everything which we study or which we go through that is exaggerated that is exaggerated now the exaggeration means what <clears throat> what is the meaning of the exaggeration so basically exaggeration means exactly the same example 10000 years okay so 10000 years so the elephant worshiped 10000 years that is an exaggeration no elephant can even live up to that particular time all right now so here apart from that if we talk about the effects of the british arrival on the historical tradition so dear students let us understand one thing that our historical record was not up to the mark not up to the mark when we were when we were living in our own way right everyone uh, there is a question by shubham tripathi 
that uh, according to you is the Ramayan uh, also hypothetical? See, these type of questions we need to be, right, we need to be avoiding and why so? Because uh, every now and then, nowadays, the people have got their own biases. So here, here, Shubham, once we will be dealing into this chapter, we will be seeing that the stories of the Ramayana or the Mahabharatas, right, those stories, they definitely have some sort of substance, some sort of substance. But the exaggeration part is definitely there. Exaggeration part is definitely there either in Mahabharata or in Ramayana or in Bible or anywhere. In any text, you will find the exaggeration, particularly if this is related to the religious, right, religious background. Now, if we talk about the effects of the British arrival on the historical tradition. So, can somebody tell me that which type of impact did the British make on the Indian historical tradition once they arrive in the Indian subcontinent? So, let me tell you a few things. Why did they, why did the British, why did the British need to understand the Indian history? What was the requirement for them? The requirement for them to understand the Indian history that was that first of all, suppose if I am going to Assam, I am going to Assam or I am going to Telangana, I belong to Uttar Pradesh, but I don't know about the local culture of Telangana or Assam. And if I am going to become a district collector in that particular area and I don't have an idea about, idea about the local tradition. So, probably it is possible that I will be taking a wrong decision which could create the sentimental damage to those people. Even though British were not careful about the sentimental damages to Indians, however, they wanted to create such an, uh, you know, such an impression that they are here for the welfare of the local people. Okay, so they wanted to create an impression at least in the initial days. So that is why they wanted to learn the Indian traditions, Indian history, so that so that they could impact the local people in the administration. Now this is why they tried to learn the customary laws, the you no know, the traditional laws of the Hinduism and Islam both to administer the local people. And what happened in that in that practice, the code of Gentu laws. Okay, a code of Gentu laws, which is nothing but the translation of translation of uh, Manu Smriti, translation of Manu Smriti. That was okay. That was edited. That was compiled. Not just the Manu Smriti was translated, but also the translation of uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita. That also took place. In fact, a society called as the Asiatic Society of Bengal, <coughs> Asiatic Society of Bengal, that was established, okay, that was established. And this Asiatic Society of Bengal was established mainly due to the contribution of two individuals. One was Warren Hastings, okay, and the other one was William Jones. So, Warren Hastings and William Jones these two people, they were specifically interested in the understanding of the local customs and traditions because they were, they were having this idea or the opinion that it is essential to understand the oriental traditions if we really want to administer these areas. Okay. Now, if we talk about the other Asiatic societies, so not just in Bengal, not just in Bengal, but also in Bombay and later on in Britain as well, in London as well, the Asiatic societies were established. Can somebody tell me that when was the Asiatic Society of Bengal established? In which year was it established? There was a UPSC question. There was a question asked by UPSC directly related to the establishment of the Asiatic Society. And the question had a statement that it had a statement that Warren Hastings was a great scholar of Indic traditions and culture. Okay, 
So this indicates the truth. Warren Hastings indeed was a scholar of these things. But he did not establish the Asiatic Society. It was established by William Jones. Okay. Aisha. Aisha is absolutely correct. 1784. 1784 AD. That was the year. And when was, uh, when was the Asiatic Society of Bombay and London established? So these societies were established in 1804 and 1823. But do we need to remember these years? We don't need to remember these years. Okay, we don't need to remember. Okay, it's not necessary to remember the years. Just remember the funda behind it. So they just wanted to study. In fact, they wanted to study and create a sense among the Indians that you guys are also from the same group of people to whom we belong. Okay, we means the British. So British and other European countries, they started establishing, they started establishing the center of, right, center of learning for the Sanskrit and other oriental languages. The oriental languages means Persian, Chinese, etc. These oriental languages were established in the various universities of Europe, resulting into the increasing popularity of, increasing popularity of the scholarly research and studies of the India and Indian literature. Got it everyone? So, if you have understood this point, now let me tell you one thing, that once the literary traditions were established, then the British started brainwashing the Indian people through the translations of, through the translations of the Indian literature or Indian historical literature. Now, why am I saying that? And what is the significance of this statement? Right. So, if I talk about the need of the Indians to, right, the, the need of the British to study the Indian scriptures. So, let me tell you that uh, basically the administrative requirements were definitely there. But at the same time, they wanted to expose that the Indian society is having a lots and lots of mis right, discrepancies, lots and lots of troubles. And therefore, the people must be, they must be subjected to the British rule so that there is the reformation of these old customs and traditions. At the same time, the right, uh, few scholars were, the few scholars were particularly interested in uh, giving certain generalizations about the Indian history. For example, you all might have heard the name of one scholar whose name was Max Muller, right, Max Muller. Max Muller was a German Sanskrit scholar who lived in the, who lived in England and he was particularly interested and therefore he was made in charge of a mega project which consisted of translating the sacred books of the different religions of the Eastern world. So, right, predominantly the books which were related to Hinduism or Brahmanism that were from India or the books related to Islam or the Confucianism of China. All these books were translated and the huge compilation of the translated versions of the religious books that was called as the sacred books of the East. It was done by Max Muller and his team. His team. Uh, Abhishek is having a good question that, Sir, can we say the failure of the land revenue system of the Hastings curious him to understand the mindset and the culture things of the Indian? Uh, not exactly, Abhishek, because uh, the uh, right land revenue system that Warren Hastings, you know, he was uh, inheriting. That land revenue system was already inherited by him since the right since the time period of later Mughals. In fact, he did not make uh, significant changes into the land revenue system until the arrival of Lord Cornwallis. There will not be the changes, significant changes in the land revenue system. Okay, more or less, Warren Hastings was following the same or similar uh, pattern of the land revenue as it was during the Mughal period in the later times. Okay, now talking about the historical features, the features of these historians who had worked under Max Muller to translate the India's uh, religious and historical books. 
so the most important thing now let me tell you the concept of let me tell you the concept of colonization here concept of colonization here so here if i am telling you colonization about the colonization let me tell you that colonization involves okay colonization involves it involves the capture of okay capture of mindset capture of mindset this is called as the ideological colonization ideological colonization okay which means that which means that in order to rule over a group of people in order to rule over a group of people you need to capture their way of thinking their ideological independence only then you will be able to prolong your authority over their existence and this is how this is how the translated versions of the religious books historical books they continuously propagated the agenda right that the indians they had they had no interest in the materialistic growth that is why they were backward that is why they never developed like the european countries and that is why they always emphasized upon the spirituality they were so much busy in the search of the god that they did not they did not care for collection of the wealth okay this is this was what the british and other historians of europe about india they were they were propagating this uh, agenda then lack of the chronological and historical sense the european scholars also propagated this agenda that the indians had no idea about the time about the chronology about the history about the collection or accumulation of the knowledge all these things were propagated and why were these propagandas propagated because they wanted that indians should lose their confidence should lose their self worth and therefore they will be following rather they will be blindly following everything which would be perpetuated by or started by the british okay perpetual despotism what is the meaning of this perpetual despotism so perpetual despotism is basically related to the idea in which the european scholars were saying european historians were saying that india and the people of india they have always been subjected to the autocratic rulers india has never seen the liberal democratic history like rome or greece india was always in a better position when somebody was ruling with the iron hand with the full stern administration this was again to justify that if the british people if they are ruling over this country with the strong handedness then it is for the benefit of this country because this country in the history also has not seen any type of liberal administration this is what they wanted to push into the minds of educated indians and let me tell you that if we educate the people as per our own methodology then we get the group of such people who start thinking like like the masters so this is exactly we can say or precisely we can say that uh, this was precisely the idea of thomas babington macaulay tb macaulay who wanted to create such a class of individuals who will be by the looks by the appearance indian but by the thought mindset and uh, behavior they will be they will be english okay so this is something which is very very crucial to understand now if the people who were educated and they were taught by the british in a wrong manner by uh, about our history then definitely some people who were educated they might have the ability of critical thinking what is the meaning of critical thinking critical thinking means that if suppose i am telling you anything but you don't believe it blindly rather you go to your sources you find out a book there and you read that book to verify that if i am saying something is it correct is it verifiable is it 100% trustworthy okay so various 
scholars of India in that time period, they adopted the approach where they kept the Indian nation in the center and, <coughs> sorry, and they adopted the methodology to research several things which was probably or intentionally ignored by the European scholars. Ignored by the European scholars. So basically we can say that to respond or to reply to the to reply to the historical distortions created by the European scholars, it was essential, it was essential that the nationalist scholars were there and they, they came into the defense of this tradition, historical tradition of India. Okay, so this is right, the first school, the first school of thought, the, the first method of writing history, right, which we have studied till now, that method of writing history is called as the Cambridge School, right? Cambridge or Oxford, sometimes also known as the Oxbridge, Oxbridge, School of, School of Historiography, okay? That means the scholars belonging to the Oxford or Cambridge, they used to think in a particular manner they used to justify that there was, there was the exploitation of the common people in India before the arrival of the British. They used to provide the historical timelines. For example, something like that Hindu period, okay, Hindu period, then Muslim period and the British period, okay, British period. So this is their method to categorize the Indian history in general. All right, the most famous scholar among uh, these groups, the most famous scholar was Vincent, okay, Vincent Arthur Smith, Vincent Arthur Smith, also known as V.A. Smith, V.A. Smith, the same V.A. Smith who has, right, who has uh, got the credit to compile the first chronological historical book of, about the Indian history and in that book, he has provided almost 30% space to the attack of Alexander and he has tried to prove that before the attack of Alexander, India was disconnected with the rest of the world. We, the Indians had no culture, no functions, no prosperity at all. So all these things were mentioned. All right. To revert to these type of propagandist history, the Indian nationalist historians, they emerged and the nationalist historians, they were basically of two types. The first school or the first category, which was purely nationalist, they tried to, they tried to uh, give a hype to the Indian customs and traditions. And the second group, that was more neutral or more logical in which the people, the people tried to understand the rationale and find the logic behind the historical claim. Okay, so you can have a list of this particular thing. So notable historians include Rajendra Lal Mitra, R.G. Bhandarkar, Panduranga, Vaman Kane, Hemchandra Rai Chaudhuri, R.C. Majumdar, K.A. Neelkanth Shastri, K.P. Jaiswal. All these are the famous Indian historians who were categorized as the nationalist historians who tried to debunk, debunk the propagandist history as mentioned by the European historians about India. For example, Ravind, Rajendra Lal Mitra has done a monumental work about the studies related to the Indo-Aryans where he has tried to prove that this was not a race, not a particular single community. This was a linguistic group which consisted of various small tribal associations or various small tribal groups. Not just that, even Rajendra Lal Mitra was the one who had clearly proven, clearly proven that there was the consumption, there was the consumption of the meat, particularly to be exact the beef in the civil, in the Vedic culture also. But it was occasional or ceremonial, at least in the form of the Havishti or in the form of the offering to the deities, okay? Apart from that, R.G. Bhandarkar, 
he has compiled the political history of Satvahanas. At the same time, he has also compiled the complete historical overview of the Vaishnavite sect of the Hinduism. Okay, Vaishnavism, which we call it as. Apart from that, if we talk about Panduranga Vaman Kane, so he was an accomplished Sanskrit scholar who has written the most detailed work about the history of, right, history of Dharma Shastras. So, whatever things or whichever things we know about our Dharma Shastras today, about our Upanishads, about our, uh, you can say, rule books of the ancient history, we can say that the credit goes to this gentleman, P. V. Kane. Okay, P. V. Kane. He is of such a level scholar. Now, Hemchandra Rai Chaudhuri. Hemchandra Rai Chaudhuri was the first Indian historian who wrote a chronological history of the Indian people and Indian land beginning from the Vedic culture or sorry, beginning from the Mahabharat era up to the up to the Gupta age. So, from Mahabharat up to Gupta age, the chronological historical narration and recording that is given to us by Hemchandra Rai Chaudhuri. Okay. Then there is one of the greatest historians that India has ever produced and his name is R.C. Majumdar. R.C. Majumdar, he was hired by the government of India to complete a project of writing the complete history. So, he wrote 11 volumes, 11 volumes of history. Remember, 11 volumes of history about the history and culture of Indian people. This is probably the huge, the most excavant, right, most, uh, most excavant work, that work related to Indian history. Okay. Then Nilkant Shastri, he wrote about the history of Southern India. Then K.P. Jaiswal wrote about the Hindu polity. Hindu polity was that book which has given us the proof that in, right, ancient India, it had the republics. So, from the book which we know, from the book about which we know about the republics, that book is related, written by K.P. Jaiswal. This book is called as Hindu polity. Okay. Very good evening, Rajesh sir. Good evening to you. So, I hope you got a clear idea that there were many historians who were doing the splendid work. And after that, if we talk about, right, after that, if we talk about some of the later developments. So, let me tell you that broadly the Indian historians were categorized into the Hindu revivalist and the rationalist historians. Hindu revivalist historians, what did they do? They were putting the criticism of, right, criticism of the prevalent social evils. For example, let me tell you that uh, a Vaman, right. So, basically, a Vaman Kane, what was he doing? He was, right, Panduranga Vaman Kane, he was also a social reformer as well as a great scholar of Sanskrit. So, he studied the Sanskrit literature. He tried to prove that there was no evidence, there was no evidence of the child marriage in the early Vedic period. And this is why even the Shastras of the early Vedic time or at least Shastras or the commentaries of the Vedas, they indicate that there should be no child marriage. Now, let me clarify one thing that any time, either today or in the ancient past or in any other time in history, whenever we have the actual understanding of the contemporary time period, this gives us a clearer idea about the customs, rituals and people of that era. For example, if we go through the books written today in the current time period, then we will automatically understand that what is the thought process of the human beings of the present time period? What is the way of communication amongst the people in the current time period? All these things will be clear if we go through the record books of the present scenario, present time. Similarly, in those times were also Say, right, in those times were also the records which were kept, not chronologically but metaphorically, but they were understood by Kane. So, apart from that evidential debunking of the myth of despotism, so as the British were propagating that Indians were always happy under the despotic rule, autocratic rule, 
they had never seen the liberty, happiness, prosperity in their entire history. The nationalist historians, particularly the Hindu revivalist historians, they successfully challenged and proved that, proved that India had the ancient republics. In fact, India was having the world's most ancient republics. You might, uh, you might have heard the name of the Lichvi kingdom, okay, the Lichvis of Vaishali, okay. And similarly, the Shakyas, the Shakyas. Similarly, there were the Koli, there were the Malav, okay. Different republics were existing in the western Himalayan foothills, western Himalayan foothills and eastern Himalayan foothills. All right, everyone. So, this is how they tried to prove the lies of western historians. Then in the rationalist group of historians, they were basically trying to compare, they were trying to compare the caste system of India with the class system of Europe because in that time period, the European scholars, they were having the understanding of what? They were having the understanding of the class categorization. If you remember, if you remember, you might have heard about Karl Marx. You might have heard about uh, the left front people. The leftist people, they always categorize the entire society into two groups. The one who are having resources and the other one, those who don't have the resources. The one who has the resource, they are called as bourgeois, right? And those who don't have the resource, they are called as proletariat. Okay, everyone. So, one is rich or uh, middle class having some resources and the other one, he is completely resourceless, most probably a worker or a laborer. So, now the rationalist historians, they will be trying to draw the parallels between the caste system and the class system and at the same time, they will be trying to reconstruct the socio-political history of the ancient and uh, medieval India so that they can prove, they can prove that inequality was existing in the ancient India, but there were certain movements, certain efforts which were trying to relegate or trying to remove this inequality. So, this is why when the influence of the rationalist historians in India started to increase, this is why even in UPSC also, even in UPSC also, we get to see the maximum questions in history from the Buddhism, Jainism, philosophical part, Upanishads part, okay, from that particular part. Or we also see the questions coming from the neutral history, neutral history. What is the neutral history? Neutral history is basically the non-political history, non-political history, okay, everyone. So, non-political history, this idea was popularized by A. L. Basham. A. L. Basham is, you know, a very famous scholar who has written a great book of Indian history called as a wonder that was India, a wonder that was India, okay. So, that book is probably the first book that looks into the customs, traditions, culture, rituals of the ancient people. It does not talk about that who was the king, who was the son of whom, it does not talk about that. It keeps that information as a secondary information. The main focus that is that what was the culture of the people. We get to know about uh, the worship methods, about the sacrifices as they were done in the Vedic culture. Credit goes to this scholar A. L. Basham. A. L. Basham. Okay. And let me tell you, the disciple, the disciple of A. L. Basham, disciple or the pupil of A. L. Basham was R. S. Sharma. Okay, R. S. Sharma, the book of whom we are studying here, he was ideological pupil or ideological disciple of A. L. Basham. He also, R. S. Sharma also talks about the culture, customs, rituals, people, society, not, he does not emphasize much upon the political details that what exactly happened, which battle took place, all these things are not described in detail or they are not the area of interest of R.S. Sharma. And UPSC also does not ask about the battles etc. in detail. 
they ask about the people oriented history they ask about the neutral or apolitical history related to the culture customs and rituals of the people okay and then there was the emergence of the left historians left means the leftist or the communist historians particularly dd koshambi who implemented the class methodology of karl marx to interpret the historical historical evolution of india so he tried to he tried to prove that the entire history of india is nothing but the struggle between the resourceless people and the people having good resources he simply tried to fit <coughs> tried to make fit the entire historical narrative into the class struggle narrative into the class struggle narrative okay so i hope you are getting the idea anybody is having any cross question that what is the meaning of class or any other questions related to this particular topic yes everyone you can ask your questions also because this is the session which is going on live okay and at the same time at the same time you can also you can also share this session with your friends as well this session is going to be in english only and if there is any problem in understanding of the statements so in that case you can also start your captions okay now emergence of the communalism and the chauvinism now what is communalism what is chauvinism guys nowadays there was there is a trend nowadays there is a trend where you get to see the practice where the you know, people they have started glamorizing they have started you know started uh, expressing the small historical facts with such a grandeur that probably it was the biggest achievement for example for example any small victory any particular battle which did not find the place in the a political or non political historical historiography so suppose if a small battle is in you know discovered and information is obtained about that battle then we have started seeing the exaggeration disproportionate exaggeration of that particular battle where the people tell that this ruler this king was a great legendary hero and he was ignored by the historians we have been taught the false history and so on but the actual reality is that the ruler who won that battle that battle was insignificant that battle was insignificant right so such type of people who try to put the who try to put the label put the label of the mega right mega star or superstars on the minuscule people in the history they are basically called as the historians or who distort the history and who are the basically, uh, basically historians who verify and cross examine the claims of the historical uh, historical characters okay and also there is another problem another problem is the mythological validations mythological validations what is the example of mythological validation for example there is a story that jesus christ he was born out of the virgin mother mary now this is a story suppose if somebody tries to say that this is a historical fact that yes he was born out of the virgin mother mary then historians will not accept this as a fact okay historians will not accept this as a fact however those people who believe on the mythology who believe on the miracles who believe that there is a possibility that yes anything can happen they will try to incorporate this mythological claim into the historical record and eventually they will try to blur they will try to erase the difference between the actual history and the mythology and the mythology okay so i hope that this is uh, absolutely clear to everybody now if we talk about the sources of historical reconstruction that how do we reconstruct the historical time right historical time yes aisha definitely aisha is saying that uh, just like ashoka killed 99 brothers to be king that was also a myth most of the historians have considered it as a myth only because deepavansh and mahavansh right as well as ashoka vadan all these text or the literature they were buddhist in nature and probably it was possible that 
in order to demonstrate Buddhism as a very, very kind, very, very reverent religion, religion, they probably tried to depict Ashoka as the most cruel person who existed on this earth. Okay, so these are certain claims which may or may not be true, may or may not be true. Got it? Now, let us understand with the help of this particular diagram, the sources of the historical reconstruction. So, mainly we can construct or reconstruct the history with the help of, right, with the help of two different sources. And which are the two different sources? We have already the, we have already understood in the previous lecture only. That is the archaeological, okay, archaeological sources and the literary sources, okay, literary sources. However, in the archaeological sources also, there are different types of sources. For example, the material remains, coins are there, then inscriptions are there, and then comes the literary sources. For example, the entire history, right, entire history of, uh, right, entire history of the Ashokan time period, Ashoka's uh, ideology, Ashoka's uh, belief or thought process, all of those details we have known from the edicts of Ashoka, from the edicts of Ashoka. Okay. Similarly, the information about the Chandragupta Vikramaditya, information about Skanda Gupta or other Gupta dynasty rulers, those informations have also, they have also come from the edicts, the edicts and inscriptions. All right. There are the inscriptions of the rulers such as Kanishk present in the Peshawar, the inscriptions of the rulers such as Mahapadmanand present in the Mysore region, present in the Mysore, Mysore region. So, which indicates very clearly that all these rulers who had installed their inscriptions in such remote areas, such distant areas from their capital, so definitely they had the, they had the political control over the, over the long located areas. Alright everyone, are you clear with this example? Is it understandable to all of you, yes or no? Be responsive everybody so that we can have a good understanding of the content. After that, if we talk about the material remains, so the entire history, entire historical record of the proto-historic time period, proto-historic time period, entire proto-history of the <coughs> Harappan civilization of the, right, of the Kiradi, right, Kiradi, okay, Kiradi civilization. Kiradi is basically, Kiradi is uh, also known as the Vaigai civilization, okay, Vaigai civilization, okay, Kiradi civilization or Vaigai civilization and then there is a, a Sinauli, okay, Sinauli culture or Sino, Sinauli civilization. So, if we talk about such places which are uh, connected to the proto-historical time period, the meaning of proto-history we have already discussed. We don't have anything else, but we only have the material evidences. We have the written epigraphs also, but we don't know the meaning of that written evidence. So, that is why the complete history can be understood with the help of the designs or the patterns or the presence or the material that is used to construct these type of pottery, utensils, products or anything else. If this could be a statue, idol, anything. After that, there are coins. We have a lots and lots of coins which belong to the different time periods of the different dynasties. For example, the coins belonging to the Gupta dynasty, they tell us that Chandragupta, Chandragupta first was married to the, married to the Lichvi princess. The coins which had the name called Ramagupta, they tell us that there was a king between Samudragupta and Chandragupta Vikramaditya and he was the elder son of Samudragupta whose name was whose name was Ramagupta. Similarly, there are coins which provide the evidences of, evidences of the different attributes or the features of the rulers. For example, Samudragupta. Samudragupta used to play Veena. 
Okay, veena is a musical instrument. How do we know that? We know it with the help of coins. Similarly, Kushana ruler Kanishk, he used to worship Lord Shiva. How do we know that? We know it from the coins of Kanishka, which is mentioning the name of Lord Shiva as O Shio, right? O Shio means He Shiva, right? And uh, later words, right, later onwards, he became a Buddhist. Got it? So, this is how we come to know. Similarly, we come to, uh, right, come to know a lot of things about the Mahajanpada age with the help of the punch marked coins. Punch marked coins carrying the symbols of the state, uneven shape, irregular shapes, all these things. Okay? Now, if we talk about, right, if we talk about the uh, other civilizations, for example, these are the specimens obtained from the Vaigai civilization. You can see this pottery, this uh, terracotta figure, or this is again terracotta face. Can you see some sort of similarity with the Harappan culture here? Similar type of eyes, narrow eyes, similar type of bull, isn't it? Looking very similar to the Harappan culture, right? Apart from that, we can see the number of uh, archaeological evidences as found in the Harappan civilization. You can see the different types of the seals of the Harappan culture showing the different stories, etc. related to the people and society of that era, right? This is the evidence from Sinoli. Sinoli is a place which is showing the presence of a solid wheel, a solid wheel, right? Okay, solid wheel, record, so you can say chariot, which is indicating the presence of, right, which is indicating the presence of the axis as well as probably this was having some sort of a huge animal, which is having the ribs of that animal printed on the ground, printed on the ground. Okay, now you can also see this evidence from the Kijadi, from Kijadi. Kijadi is in Vaigai civilization, also known as Vaigai civilization. It is in Madurai, in Tamil Nadu region. So, we can have the number of evidences similarly from which we can have the conclusion that these are all essential to understand the history. Now, tomorrow onwards, we are starting the Stone Age and prehistoric time period. So, be on time. 4 p.m. is the time that you have to remember. But in case if you are a serious candidate who is aspiring for the 2024 civil services examination and want to learn more about history, more about all the other subjects exclusively for the exam purpose, then join this particular batch of prelims to interview called P2I batch, right? Here you will be getting the classes in the bilingual English or Hindi media as per your expectations and you have to enroll for this only at a nominal cost of Rs. 29,999 if you are using this code ASR live. You are going to get a lots of benefits here, especially the benefits such as the books will be provided to you along with the current affairs material as well as the GS and not just that but also the prelims and mains test series will be given along with this. So, all these things will be having a special feature called as the mains residential program in which you will be called to the study IQ campus, given a facility of library along with the classes and these entire things will be given at the cost of so much, right, so much affordability that is 29,999. So, as our mission is that we are here to make the education affordable for all of you, so you can join this session for sure. So, thank you so much everyone for watching it. Let's meet in the next class tomorrow. Thanks a lot for this session. Bye-bye. Have a great day and Jai Hind.